Jesus in Scripture, week five. He is always present. He is God in person. Thank you for watching another episode of Jesus in Scripture. It is my hope your faith will be encouraged by the things revealed in God's Word. I have been referring these past five weeks to John 5, verse 39, and it says, You study the Scriptures diligently because you think that in them you have eternal life. These are the very scriptures that testify about me. This is why I'm leading the study, because I am certain that we cannot even begin to understand the scope of God's love for us if we don't know that Jesus' mission to save us from sin is part of an eternal plan conceived in the heavenly realms before the creation of the world. We find that in Ephesians chapter 1. Jesus is personal. He speaks to each one of us as individuals. Jesus is the person in whom God reveals himself. God is love, and Jesus is the person that shows us the love of God is in enduring and redeeming. We read in Jeremiah 31, verse 3, the Lord God says, I have loved you with an everlasting love. It was God's will that he would build an enduring home for us, a land and an inheritance that could never pass away. We were created to be covered with the person who is Jesus, so that in him, we would lack nothing. Jesus is the uniter. He unites us with God, and he unites the scripture, both the old and the new. Jesus said that all scripture was about him. The Old Testament is incredibly Christ-centered. The thread throughout scripture is consistently Christ. The covering of Adam and Eve with animal skins, the flood, the ark, the Passover and the Red Sea, the wilderness and the promised land, exile and return, war and peace, kingdom and kings, prophets and priests, songs of lament and rejoicing, and especially the lives of faithful sufferers and the blood of righteous martyrs. The persons of Jesus shaped all of this to prepare the world for a time when he would become the seed of woman, first prophesied in Genesis 3.15. Jesus was miraculously born into this world to save us from the pattern of sin that separates us from God. But God's desire is for us to be with him and for him to be with us. Matthew 1.23 says, the virgin will conceive and give birth to a son and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. God with us in the flesh began with the virgin birth. But the message of scripture is that God was with us in the person of Jesus a very long time ago, even before the foundation of the world. That, of course, is revealed in Ephesians chapter one. And now, the story of Abraham and the offering of the son of promise. Abraham was a special friend of God. He was a dear friend with whom God even visited and talked with as friends do. In the account in Genesis 18, when the Lord appeared to Abraham near the great trees of Mamre, he came to tell him some happy news. Genesis 18:10 says, and he said, I will certainly return to you about this time next year and behold, Sarah, your wife, shall have a son. Sarah was listening at the entrance of the tent, and she laughed to herself. So Sarah laughed to herself in verse 12, and as she thought inside her, her, her mind, not out loud, she said, After I'm worn out and my Lord is old, will I now have this pleasure? Then the Lord said to Abraham, Why did Sarah laugh and say, I will... Will I really have a child now that I am old? Is anything too hard for the Lord? I will return to you at this appointed time next year, and Sarah will have a son. God revealed Sarah's doubt as a kindness to Abraham and Sarah. It was to remind them who the promiser was and that he is able to keep each and every promise. God's message to them is to have faith and believe because I am anxious to come back next year and celebrate 
with my friends. Genesis 21, 5 through 8 says, Abraham was a hundred years old, and his son Isaac was born to him. Sarah said, God has brought me laughter, and everyone who hears about this will laugh with me. And she added, who would have said that Sarah would nurse children, yet I have borne him a son in his old age. The son of promise finally came in their old age. Hebrews 11, 11 through 12 sums it up this way. And by faith, even Sarah, who was past childbearing age, was enabled to bear children because she considered him faithful who made the promise. And so from this one man, and he was as good as dead, came descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and as countless as the sand on the seashore. Now back to earlier where I mentioned the Old Testament is incredibly Christ-centered. Let's go to Genesis 22. That, that, that's the account of the offering of Isaac. This account tests Abraham's faith, Abraham's faith, but it's been a stumbling block to so many as they read how God commanded Abraham to sacrifice his son, his only son. Genesis 22, verse 2. Then he said, Take now your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I will tell you. This would be a total scandal. The son of promise killed, making it impossible for God to keep his promise. But God, but Abraham, Abraham who's whose faith was great, whose friendship with God was great. He knew that God could and would raise the dead. And he knew that if God made a promise, that he will make good on his promise. Abraham believed whatever happens, if, if, if God tells me to do this, he will raise the dead. I'm certain of this because the Hebrew writer recorded in Hebrews 11, 17 through 19, says this, by faith, Abraham, when God tested him, offered Isaac as a sacrifice. He who had no, he who had embraced the promises was about to sacrifice his one and only son, even though God had said to him, it is through Isaac your offspring will be reckoned. Abraham reasoned that God could even raise the dead, and so in a manner of speaking, he did receive Isaac back from the dead. When you understand the pattern, the death and resurrection of a son, Genesis 22 is no longer a stum stumbling block. It's no longer a reason to, to wonder why God would do such a thing. God never sanctioned human sacrifice and never once never once permitted it but it was a test and he knew that Abraham would pass the test giving up everything we love and then sacrificing it to God is not enough to pay the price of redeeming us we cannot do it for ourselves God does it for us that's why God stopped him even Abraham giving his own son would have been futile and not acceptable. It was a lesson. Everything you have, everything you love is not enough. But I will provide, says the Lord God. Abraham is the father of the faithful. His faith, your faith, and my faith is tied to this one amazing act of grace the death and resurrection of a beloved son. Jesus was present there with Abraham and Isaac. They were acting out the gospel in their example of faith. Mount Moriah is the place where Jer Jerusalem would someday be built and the place where Jesus would, in the fullness of time, be crucified, buried, and raised from the dead. Genesis 22:14 says, so Abraham called that place, the Lord will provide. And to this day it is said on the mountain of the Lord, it will be provided. 
The Old Testament saints saw Christ promised in this event. A future atonement to come where the Lord himself will provide. Fast forwarding to the time of Christ, John the Baptist, baptizing in the Jordan, looked up and he saw Jesus approaching. He said through the Spirit, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. God has indeed provided for us. David saw this in Psalms 22, 31 when he said, They will proclaim his righteousness, declaring to a people yet unborn, He has done it. And Jesus said on the cross, It is finished. Jesus has done it, and the plan of salvation is finished. Jesus the person was there with Abraham. There are many things that point to it, but Jesus said it plainly in John 8, 56 through 58. Your father Abraham rejoiced at the thought of seeing my day. He saw it and was glad. You are not yet 50 years old, they said to him, and you have seen Abraham? Very truly I tell you, Jesus answered, before Abraham was born, I am. The thing I learned from God's test of Abraham is that God does not require from us what we cannot do. The Lord will provide. John 3.16 says, and we all know this, the most, probably the most familiar passage in the, in the Bible. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. The message is clear. Believe and obey. That's all we are required to do. We're not required to do some great deed. We're not required to, to change the world. We're just required to work on our own hearts and change our own minds and be Christ-centered and Christ-shaped and allow God and through His Holy Spirit to work in us. Thank you for your time. Thank you, and God bless.